One of the more popular discussions online and on TV is the idea of bringing back extinct animals like the woolly mammoth or the thylacine, you know, resurrecting those wonderful lost animals from the dead, basically, using, you know, genetic information we find in long frozen mammoth cadavers. Um, we want to do this, I think, because we're fascinated by their former existence. You know, how big were they? How did they act? Uh, what did they really look like? And, you know, we want to experience them. We want to see them, maybe even touch them. Uh, the problem is we don't have the genetic information and know-how yet to quite make it happen. Though we're getting closer every year. In much the same way, we often lament the loss of our greatest, you know, historical, local triumphs in architecture. Lost houses and homes that once stood boldly along our streets. The difference, of course, is that these houses and buildings aren't woolly mammoths at all. They can be rebuilt and brought back from the dead without complicated DNA or groundbreaking science. Um, you know, we have photos, we have outlines, and we have imagination. And in some cases, uh, we may even have old architectural plans. Uh, not sure about that yet, but I'm looking into it. So, we also have all the pieces and the materials needed to approximate, you know, these old houses. The wood, the limestone, the brick, the nails, the hammers, the saws, all the tools that you'd need to bring an old house back from the dead. So, what it really takes to make it happen is the willingness to do it. And the development dollars. I mean, let's be honest here, money. Um, but what if we brought back some of those most treasured homes and houses that Bloomington ever had and made them useful again somehow? But where would we put them? So, with the recent demolition of the post office, an idea came to me. And what if we rebuilt Block 13, as it was known on insurance maps of the past, and created something you know wonderful outrageous exciting something so great that it couldn't possibly fail something that was you know civic minded community focused and even gave the local economy a lift provided more jobs and at the same time created a historical precedent maybe something that might have been done before but maybe never on such a scale okay let me show you what i mean so in 1958, as I've mentioned before, a whole neighborhood of houses on Block 13 here in Bloomington were claimed by eminent domain. The families were uh, forced out of their homes. Uh, they were paid a sum deemed fair by a court. And the whole block that you know these families lived on, uh, probably for generations, was just basically bulldozed uh, to make way for the new, <laughs> often criticized, post office. Well, after barely 50 years of service, this magical post office that was so important to local officials that they had to sacrifice and ransack a whole neighborhood of family homes to build uh, it. This bionic post office that was so important it had to be built right there on land south of the First United Methodist Church because no other land was good enough for it this magnificent post office was finally demolished um, well not long ago starting I think last week now I may have mentioned that some of the homes on block 13 uh, would probably be almost 130 years old today if uh, they weren't demolished to build this bionic post office um, and I don't blame the post office for those houses being demolished. Regardless, what if we brought that old neighborhood back? Well, there is that little trouble of the land being owned by FUMC, uh, the First United Methodist Church. And then there's development monies, and well, we don't know what all the houses look like that once stood, stood there. So, um, but let's just assume, uh, for the sake of fun, that none of these things are barriers. So let's just proceed. Um, first, what should a new neighborhood of houses provide? 
Well, in honor of the Golden Age, you know, that time between the 1870s and the 1920s when Bloomington was really blossoming, what if we deemed them sort of business slash residential here on Block 13? Um, so many people in those golden days lived and worked out of their homes, um, and buildings had mixed use. Lawyers, doctors, dentists, restaurants, you know, in structures across Bloomington, business was conducted downstairs while people lived upstairs. Uh, so I thought, well, let's stay true to that philosophy. Besides, we're seeing more and more of this trend coming back into city planning, which I think is a breath of fresh air, frankly, and a, sw uh, a switch from the old strip mall and giant box store approach to architecture and design and urban planning. So next we need to make the new block a place for the community to gather informally or formally for food, fun, conversation, relaxation. This should be a nice open area where people can sit at a shaded table and drink coffee, eat lunch or dinner. And it's a public place for citizens to gather. Um, all right, let's start with the last aerial photo of Block 13 and work from there. Well, it's not the last photo, but it is the official last uh, city photo in 1949. First, let's select which lots we want to rebuild. Uh, we only have reference photos for 301 South Washington Street, if you can see that tiny blue square, which was formerly Claude Mallet's house, Mayor Claude Mallet's house. So we can rebuild that one the way it was or close to it because we have a photo. Next, we'll create a community square on the inside of the block. We'll go with, say, like a cobblestone type surface uh, for the top half of the block and then just use natural grass at the bottom. Now, where the old alleyways were, we'll add brick walkways. I don't know. It could be something else. I'm, I'm not an architect. I'm just throwing some ideas out here. And, um, you know, we could put a fountain in the middle, a real fountain, you know, not one of those holes in the ground with lights and a sprinkle of water coming up, you know, a real serious fountain. And, you know, we'll surround that fountain with a circle of brick as well. Now let's add the tables with the circular uh, parasols. Uh, some people call them umbrella tables or tables with umbrellas. Um, they don't have to be different colors, but for now, I'll keep it colorful and just kind of throw them in there with some pastel colors. Okay, we don't want a whole lot of parking because we want people to walk or even ride their bikes, mostly walk. But uh, FUMC does need some parking on this block uh, for patrons, so their el elderly patrons can maybe park closer on Sunday. So we'll add a tiny you know some tiny lots uh, down here on the south made of brick uh, let's add some cars in there and so no one in the square can actually see the parking lot we'll plant some nice indigenous trees around it so I'm not going to be adding any mountain spruces or giant pines or any other bush that belongs uh, in the Rocky Mountains um, that we too often use as ornaments or just kind of randomly uh, toss them in there because of code. Um, you know, we live in a small city here in Indiana, so I'm using local species only. I don't want someone to get confused and think they're in Colorado. So here's the exciting part. Here's where we get to decide which, you know, historic houses to build because we don't have plans for all these houses. We have one house we have a photo of in this whole neighborhood, and that's the Mallet House. So house one is going to be the Mallet House. We know who lived there. We have photos of it. So we can make that one. At least something close to it. And we have the specs, of course, from... Uh, basic specs from the Sanborn maps. Now, we know the house two was actually owned by the Orchard family. But we don't have any photos of it. So for house two, I'd like to rebuild the Free Showers house. Um, which used to sit along North Walnut. For house three, I'm choosing a house that used to sit along 4th Street until the 1980s and was one of the last Italianates in town. You may remember it as the Bynum Supply Company, but it was actually owned 
by the Fletcher family in the early 1900s. So just for fairness, um, this house really should be called the Fletcher Bynum House. House 4 was a behemoth in 1958 before demolition on this corner. Uh, so I thought we'd replace it with a similarly large Victorian behemoth, the infamous Calvin Worrell and his mansion that once stood on the northeast corner of, uh, of Lincoln and Kirkwood, where the Monroe County Public Library stands today. Uh, not only did this serve as a home, albeit briefly, because Calvin you know, moved away and got into all kinds of trouble, but uh, it also sar served as an army barracks, um, and then later on uh, as a jazz bar in the 1930s, and then finally as a doctor's office. Um, it was demolished in 1968, of course, to build the library. But here, it should fit in perfectly on the corner um, of the Block 13. Now, House 5, I picked the old Fairview School. I know it's big, but, you know, it was a stunning architectural building. I mean, and it was totally talked up in the newspapers and treasured by local citizens you know who looked on it with some serious pride because it reflected uh, the whole community um, unfortunately it was no longer treasured anymore after world war ii as many things weren't and demolished um, so we could build i think something that looks very much like fairview school here maybe a downsized version of this building and it could be made to fit on this lot and serve as maybe apartments uh, upstairs and offices downstairs I mean who wouldn't want to walk into this building and work I would I would love for my office to be in this building um, so house six is one of my favorite extinct local structures the one I wanted to bring back to life for some time this is 121 North Indiana, and it was once the family home of the famous Bradfute family. If you know anything about the Bradfutes, they also had a building named after them that used to stand uh, along South College as well. Um, it caught on fire several times, but eventually it was demolished to build um, the big bank we have there on the corner of uh, Kirkwood and College today. Now, the Bradfutes owned the Bloomington Telephone, the local newspaper, probably the biggest paper in town. There is enough evidence now to say that this house that they lived in uh, was likely designed by local architect John Nichols. Uh, and I have Michael Carter, uh, a local historian, to thank for a lot of the information that led to that conclusion. Now, the house was passed down from Walter Bradfute to his son Blaine in 1929 when Walter died. And, of course, Blaine carried on working at the Bloomington Telephone. Now, it would be wonderful to see this building again in all its limestone glory. I don't care. As a restaurant, as a coffee house, as a little store, whatever. Um, it is really a great structure. House 7 would be one of the handful really of wonderful old homes that once stood on west kirkwood we all know the batman house i.e the garrett all right that's like the last surviving gem of what once was west kirkwood filled with those kind of beautiful old homes mansions really mansions so the one i picked was 417 west kirkwood which was the duncan family home which used to sit on the uh, south east corner of rogers and um, West Kirkwood. Uh, Henry Duncan was a lawyer, a judge, a local politician. His home really was the envy of many. Um, and while it looks a lot like the Italianate brother um, that we mentioned earlier on East 4th Street that we're going to rebuild, also known as the Bynum Supply Company, um, additions to this house in the back really gave it sort of almost a Victorian flair. Uh, it was demolished along with so many others in the post-World War II demolition derby. Uh, it was made of brick, uh, just like its uh, Washington Street predecessor. It was built in the late uh, 1800s. And I hope, I hope it's built again. We got one more left. And that's House 8. 
And this rebuilding project wouldn't be complete without at least one Greek revival. And it wouldn't be complete, really, without the very house that once fueled so much local and statewide outrage that it essentially was the inspiration for the preservationist movement in Bloomington in the 1970s. So House 8, I propose, should be the Morton Hunter Mansion, which stood so proudly near 11th and Walnut for over 100 years before its sad dismantling and demolition, which happened in 1974. It was the sad victim of confused rezoning, old age, neglect, really in a time when demolition seemed the answer to just about every case of old home, old homes and houses. So General Morton Hunter, if you know, uh, you probably do. He was a Civil War hero, a congressman, and almost a state governor, Indiana's state governor. But that really wasn't enough history, unfortunately, in the 1970s to save this beautiful mansion, which at the time, by the time it was demolished, was in really bad shape. Now, it would be great to see it standing again. It would be great to see it repurposed as a law office or a real estate office. You know, the downstairs um, used as offices with living space, upstairs. Now, that's this is my whole idea. It, it, it has flaws. Of course it does. I, I'm just an amateur developer. But it sure sounds like a cool idea. And the more I daydream about it, you know, the more I like it. Now, is it likely to happen? Nah, probably not. But uh, it won't happen, certainly, if I have to pay for it. But I am sure there are architects and developers out there with the skill, know-how, and share kind of um, a similar civic-minded, community-focused vision. Share the same vision that I do. So if you know anyone who's interested, you know, give me a ring. I won't be sitting by my phone, though.